the ears. Go away from shopping, and if you look at your Port Acre Paradise here in New Zealand, with a washing line in there, with a barbecue, and then with a lot of ornamentals and a lot of lawns, so you can make a bit uh, a noise on the weekend, mowing the lawns. This is it as we know it. Hardly any food coming off from, but you buy food from all corners of the world and all transported with unrenewable, climate-changing, damaging uh, fossil fuel. So, why not doing this? Look at this. This is permaculture. Before and after. Look at this. A quarter-acre section can feed four people with greens. I don't, do not exaggerate. Because you can use all the structures, get those ornamentals that you can't eat out of the way and bring in some uh, edible plants, uh, edible landscape, we call it in permaculture. This is self-sufficiency. This will help you in a crisis because the food is right there. It's not packaged, it's fresh, not transported, so very healthy to eat. And if you carry on, close the loop, whatever comes off here, you eat it, perhaps have a composting toilet and recycle it back, or if you have scraps coming out of the kitchen, you feed it the worms, and you have to fertilize it with a worm tea or wormy cast, you put it back in the system again. So that's what actually recycling means. When we talk about recycling, as Rachel mentioned it, it's actually not the proper recycling, because in English, look at the, your dictionary, it says recycling means to take a resource, use it, and put it back where it came from. How can you do this with plastic, aluminium, or paper, or whatever? You're not taking the, the plastic bottle back to Iraq and put it under the sand, and you wait six million years, and then you suck it out again in six million years' time, and you have oil again. You're not doing that. You can't. It's not recycling. It's actually the plastic bottle might get recycled, sure, melt it down into pellets. You make something inferior out of it because you always have the polymers breaking down to an inferior um, quality. And then you make a flower pot out of it. Who is recycling flower pots here? How? I give them to someone else who recycles. Yeah, but what will they do when, the, when it cracks and breaks down in the UV light? Where does the flower pot end up? In the landfill, in the big hole. So that's not recycling. It looks good, a bit of window dressing and a bit of greenwash in between, but not honesty. When we want to get honest about sustainable living, we have to ask ourselves these questions. And we also have to learn to actually analyze what ecological footprint do we actually have. And there is a, an easy way to do that. I just want to show you one thing, for instance. We have to start getting psych into cyclic thinking. For instance, here we have the nutrient cycle. It's intact here. If you live sustainable, grow your own food, go to the composting toilet and you return it again. You can do that for thousands of years. You're not depleting the system. But look what we, we have done here. We have broken this cycle. About 100 years ago, we came in with the artificial fertilizer and the fossil fuel energy. We grow food now. Then we eat it, we go to the toilet, flush it out nicely into the ocean. And this morning I had a meeting with our new mayor and the councillors about the nutrient load that we send out to the ocean. We had lots of items, but this was one. Rodney hardly managed to get the permit from the ARC because we sent out so many nutrients and so much pollution into the ocean. This is not sustainable either and also not helping climate change. All right, any questions or any comments, please make some. We have a lot to cover. Yes, Kai? A comment going back to the Joe, not a question, but a comment. Um, nature has been so incredibly um, beneficial in designing New Zealand. We all know it's a beautiful country, but do we ever think that it's a long, narrow country as something else? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And our uh, westerly wind is, is the prevailing wind. And Lake Taupo in the North Island, which is more or less round, the biggest lake, at the highest point, the longest river, and gets supplies nine electric power stations. Mm. Couldn't have wished better, could you? Yes, we're very lucky, but you can see the situation. We have a demand growth of 2% annually in New Zealand for electricity. 
and it cannot be supplied sustainably, even with wind and whatever geothermal or whatever you try to do. It, it, we're going way over the sustainable supply that we have available. Sure, we are lucky, but you have to remember how we behave, and it was touched on with Trish, the 101 green things. Uh, actually, if you turn off the standby throughout New Zealand, we can turn off one power plant just for the standby electricity for all our gadgets that, you know, always on standby, day and night sometimes. In the United States, they could uh, uh, decommission three nuclear power plants if everybody would turn off the standby. That's fighting. You see, it's our behavior. But we have to learn how do we actually measure our behavior. And I brought one example along. I teach many different ways of seeing your ecological footprint. And I want to remind you, there are really good methods of measuring it. One is energy. That's not a spelling mistake. Not energy, energy. Embodied energy. Everything absorbed a lot of energy to make it. And you can actually calculate how much oil is in here if you want in that felt pain. In this felt pain. Another one would be, that's a really shocking one, if you apply this to gadgets or whatever, or anything, this called energy return on energy invested. And all of a sudden you find out that photovoltaic solar panels have to live about 50 years to return the true cost of production and disposal, of course. So that's a frightening thing. You apply these calculations to most of our items or the way we live, it's a frightening result. And no wonder that the ecological footprint for New Zealanders is 2.6 planets. That's what we use. Do we have 2.6 planets? I only know one. I've been around many times. I love it very much. But I don't know another one. And Joe, what's that energy? What's an example of that? Uh, for, I'll give you an example right here. It's on the wall here. I took a supermarket egg. You probably all know an egg and probably love an egg. And so, okay, here it is. A better behaved supermarket egg, cheap. Really, I find it very cheap when you start seeing what you need to produce this egg. Look at this. To have this egg, you need an enormous industry here of coal. It's also a uh, fossil fuel, of course. Uh, you have to make a bit of metal because you have to build a platform out in the sea and pump a bit of oil out of the sea. You need a ship. Why do you need a ship to produce an egg? Why? Because these poor chooks get fed a lot of pellets. Where do pellets come from? Well, you need fish. That, that you have to fish somewhere in Peru or somewhere in South Africa or somewhere in the waters of other countries. And then you grind up those fish bodies into fish meal. That gets them mixed with a grain that is grown perhaps in Canada in the Midwest, in the States, or somewhere else, or maybe in Canterbury, but I doubt it. And then you finally have a pellet. But how can you grow grain? Look at this. You need an enormous amount of energy. You need a refinery, because that's where they make the biocides, you know, the pesticide. That's what you need to spray on. You need a fertilizer. It's again oil, comes from the refinery. You need the plastics to package it, you see yourself. 